Welcome everyone to this amazing journey that I've been having, exploring the philosophy of objectivism, picking the brains of their best exponents. And today we have like the biggest prize of them all. We're interviewing Harry Binswanger, who some of you already know, he met and knew and ran and he worked with her. So Harry has contributed a lot to the philosophy of objectivism, especially in the epistemological part of it with a book called how we know. Harry, thank you so much for being here and letting me uh, talk to you and ask you questions. Thank you for the work you do in spreading the ideas of freedom. Thank you so much. So I wanted to start with the journey of philosophy, because after so many years of people trying to figure out what is the human uh, mind, where, why are we here, you, you will think, okay, how can a contribution be made in the 20th century, right? Probably everyone already figured it out before. Right. But no, in the journey of philosophy and throughout history, we can see that, of course, there are advancements, but there was something that Rand did that no one else did before. What was it so special about Ayn Rand? What was uh, unique about Ayn Rand, what she brought to philosophy, is the value-oriented approach of an artist. She was a novelist first and developed her philosophy in order to create the ideas and premises in her characters that she thought made them fit to survive and prosper in reality. Mm -hmm. So she approached philosophy from a very absolute black and white passionate perspective. Then you add in that she was a great introspector so that she looked at how her own mind worked. Her contributions are fundamentally about values and the nature of the mind. Mm -hmm. She solved the two problems that were raised in the Renaissance that were never solved because Aristotle got us going. Aristotle, to whom she owed a tremendous debt, which she constantly mentioned. And that well, was my next question, yeah. the connection with Aristotle. She. Uh, Aristotle created civilization, really. Well, Thales and, and some of the earlier philosophers first, but Aristotle created modern civilization by defining the basic principles of epistemology. But Ayn Rand solved the two remaining problems, the theory of concepts, how concepts are formed, how they relate to reality, that's on the mind side, and the basis of moral value, which she solved the is ought problem that David Hume had crystallized in the 1700s, and which makes everyone think you can't have a science of ethics, mm -hmm. that value judgments are subjective and you can't have principles based on reality. Reason and reality have nothing to do with values, they think, and she showed how reason and reality are precisely the thing that has to do with values. But you would think that, how is it possible that humanity could progress as it did the scientific revolution, the industrial revolution, and still there was no one philosopher that did that job before? It took until Ayn Rand in the 20th century. So how come humanity could advance in, in other aspects like medicine, uh, math, science, and the basic questions of philosophy were still not answered? Because the basic questions were answered by Aristotle. The fields you named were the ones that he laid the foundations for. Right. Science, all, science began in the Renaissance by the scientists who studied the Aristotelian philosophy. Galileo studied at Padua, the center of Aristotelianism in Italy. And all of the uh, early scientists, contrary to the propaganda, which attacks Aristotle on uh, as not being a good scientist, he was a, the first biologist. And Darwin said that. He said all the others are like schoolboys compared to Aristotle. And he meant it. He knew what he was talking about. Aristotle did dissections. Mm -hmm. Aristotle classified animals, developed a system of taxonomy. He spent years of his life on a Greek island studying sea creatures and eggs and so forth. Uh, but more than that, he laid down the methodology that science must have. Well, to say he laid down the methodology is too extreme. He defined the fact that science must start with observation mm -hmm. 
and look very, very carefully at reality and build the theories up from reality. The, the other schools a different hold you like start from pure reason. Right, Plato's yeah. all about like the other world, the imaginative. Right, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And he thought you could commune with the form of the good and learn everything that there is worth knowing. Did you know that Plato says you should stop up your eyes, uh, stop up your ears, close your eyes when you want to do science, when you want, I mean, they didn't have such a thing, so, but when you want to come to know the truths about the world, you have, it's really truths about another world and your senses are in the way. Aristotle was a keen observer. But Aristotle was a student of Plato, right? Yes. And, and how come uh, the student and the, and, the and the master go di different ways? Because he, he was independent. Aristotle said, um, I choose truth over our friends. Mm. Speaking of the Plato and the people in the academy, he studied 20 years under Plato. And he was known as the mind of the academy, Plato's school, the academy. Was Aristotle the first philosopher that ran red? No. Mm -hmm. uh, Plato would, would have been the first okay. that she read. She studied in college philosophy under a Platonist. Okay. And, and became an Aristotelian, like it, happened with yes, Aristotle. <laughs> yes, but she read Aristotle too. And right. She was knocked out by what she read. But Aristotle was, uh, had roots in medicine. You mentioned medicine. Mm -hmm. uh, he had a theory of mathematics that is correct and needs reviving. And he's the father of logic. Right. Plus, said all knowledge comes from the senses. So he laid the foundations for science and medicine and mathematics, which is, you know, the things right. you mentioned. Yeah. Those are his fields. So let's move forward uh, in history. We have the Dark Ages and, you know, a lot of knowledge was monopolized by a few priests that got access to it, but most of the population was not Couldn't thinking read. about, yeah, philosophical right. things. And then we go to the 19th century. Classical liberalism starts. Um, who did she respect from this period of time? Uh, in my mind comes, for example, Frédéric Bastiat, which I think he was brilliant in, uh, in also using uh, simple examples by observing reality. I don't know if you know, he has a, a, a tale of, uh, let's put a tax on the sun. The sun, yes. yes. The myth of the candle makers. The candle makers, yeah. yes. And, and I like him because he, he also like ran, you know, like finding these concrete examples of the absurdities that sometimes people defend. So in the 19th century and, and about classical liberalism, what are the, who were the, the people she respected? Well, she would go back further first that, uh, to, the, uh, to John Locke. Okay. John Locke, although his deep philosophy is very flawed, uh, his political philosophy is almost perfect. He's the creator of the concept of rights. He's the one who came up with that in its full form. There were hints of it earlier, but he was the one who really developed it. The right to self-defense, the consent of the governed, the role of government being to protect freedom, not to destroy it, uh, the... Um, idea of Republican form of government with representatives, but not democracy. Uh, what, what's wrong with anarchy? He has a great argument. I mean, it's so quick, but it's great argument. He, his second treatise of government is a fantastic work, as is his letter concerning toleration, both on freedom of speech. Both of them are, are terrific, and she admired him. He's the and direct ancestor of Thomas Jefferson, who was the American founder that she liked best. Ah, well, I have a question about that. <laughs> okay, and then, then going into the 19th century, um, Bastiat, I believe that she liked. I know that those around her were reading him and liking him. I certainly think he's fabulous. He's also got interesting economic theories and economic sophisms and economic harmonies. There's two books on that. I don't think he got that as right, but he has a very interesting overview perspective. But he's also, you pointed out, I guess maybe being French, 
he has this dramatic flair oh, yeah. in his writing. Yeah. And Ayn Rand also went for the dramatic exactly. concrete. Yeah. In, in his little book, The Law, because you know he died when he was only 49 uh, from a lung disease. And, and in The Law, he says, until my lungs explode, I will defend the right of uh, the individual to be free. Paraphrasing is not exactly his words, mm -hmm. but he's like very dramatic in the way yeah. he writes. Yeah. Yeah. So among the 19th century philosophers that one thinks of, she did not like Spencer, whom she regarded as a collectivist because he argued for the good of the race, meaning the human race, not one particular race. Uh, and uh, John Stuart Mill, she regarded as the destroyer of the work of Locke and Jefferson, which he was. He was terrible. And he's usually thought of as a, an, an advancer of liberty but he isn't, uh, and he was a, a very much an altruist. And as you know, she favored the virtue of selfishness, not favored is too mild. She crusaded, made her life's work, right. the defense of the individual's pursuit of his own self-interest, right. rational self-interest. Right. So uh, going back to the founding fathers, you already mentioned that Thomas Jefferson was uh, her, like the one she respected the most. Why I is think that? so. Because of the declaration, which she said was the most eloquent political statement in human history. And I think I agree with her, it's wonderful. And uh, the basic ideas of Locke being transmitted into a form that we could act on. Mm -hmm. In the, You know that Locke, uh, sorry, Jefferson echoed the very language of Locke, mm -hmm. uh, their phrases from Locke's second treatise that are in the declaration. I didn't know Yeah. That. Wow. And he said, if you want to educate a child in our culture and he can only read one book, it should be Locke's second treatise of government. Wow. And so he was very passionate about his attachment to Locke. What about the founding fathers that she disliked, if she had any? I never heard any uh, criticism of any of them. My own favorite, just speaking for myself, is Madison, the yeah. author of the Constitution, mm. and a, a you know kind of second generation after Jefferson. I mean, he knew Jefferson well. He was part of that group, but he was the younger kid right. in the group of founding fathers. But he's fantastic. Uh, Franklin, as a scientist, is wonderful, uh, and and generally is good with some flaws. I'm not one of the pro-Hamilton people. I think Hamilton was a little uh, too left-wing or collectivist, but in today's context, he would be a giant. I mean, he's all of them were so great compared to the clowns we now have. Right, right, no, that's true. So let's move to the 20th century. Let's talk about Austrian economics. Let's. The rise of Ludwig von Mises, Friedrich Hayek, um, and then, of course, because of that, uh, the public choice the school that comes after Ronald Coase, Robert Nozick, and, and this economist movement that is also parallel to the formation of objectivism. Why, what did she think about Austrian economics? The economics she approved of, the philosophical, semi-philosophical base that she gave, that they gave it, Mises in particular, she thought it was terrible. And it was. Uh, Mises, if you read the first 99 pages, I think it is, of human action, comes out with his view of man and uh, the issue of the individual versus the state. And there are terrible things in there, determinist, subjectivist, and so forth. But when you get into the economics part, it's wonderful. And she was the woman who popularized von Mises. If it weren't for her, and reviewing his works in her publication and praising them, I think Mises would be pretty unknown today. Did they meet? Huh? Did they meet? Yes, yes. They knew each other and they had uh, a positive relationship. I think there were times when each of them got angry at the other. That's good. But, uh, Healthy debate. Not, not, uh, nothing that... Uh, led to either one of them disavowing the other, they liked each other. Mises said about Ayn Rand, and she, got, she heard this indirectly, she's the only man in America 
Wow. And she was thrilled at that compliment because she admired masculine virtues, you know, right. so she was very pleased to hear that. I also heard that uh, in a Montpellerin uh, meeting, Mises said, said, say whatever you want about her, but she has done more with her novels, spreading these ideas, than all of you together with your academic papers. I don't know if it's true. It's a gossip that runs around my libertarian university, but... The, the fact is true that she has done more for spreading liberty than any economist. Right. And uh, it will always be that way because values trump economics. That is, if you look at what's going on today, uh, um, AOC, yes. uh, or, or t what is it, Cortez? Uh, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. Ocasio-Cortez, yes. yes, said when the, it was pointed out she had her facts wrong, Facts don't matter, the morality matters. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. She made a famous statement about a month ago to that effect. And that's the way that people act. If you think something is right, it's a tribute to people. If you think something is morally right and something else is morally wrong, you're going to side with the morally right, even if you think there's a cost. Right. And just, you know, the fact that socialism has failed in, is it hundreds or dozens? You know, I can reel off the countries in which socialism has led to poverty and violence and hatred and misery, but it doesn't, every one of them, it's not like, oh yeah, but there are five that really did well, uh, every one of them, but it doesn't sway people because they think selfishness is wrong. Yes. And capitalism is the system of selfishness. It is. And that's what's great about it. But getting back to Mises and the economists. She did not approve of Hayek. Okay. She did not approve of Hayek. She never... Did reviewed. they meet? Huh? Did they meet Hayek and Rand? I would think so, maybe once. But she read The Road to Serfdom, and you right. should see her marginal notes in that. She, she attacks it viciously. I had a conversation with her about Hayek, and I said, why don't you like Hayek? Mm -hmm. And she said, it's intellectual. Uh, he is not a defender of liberty. I read recently, I tried to, I'm starting and picking my way through, The Fatal Conceit, and it is horrible. His philosophical basis for, for capitalism is that, that people are too stupid to do the right thing, so we have to rely on spontaneous order. That's his big phrase, spontaneous order. Right, right. It's not spontaneous. And it's an order is a package deal of uh, marching in file and the coordination of the market. But Harry, wouldn't you agree that the majority of people choose not to think that they just pass through this life? Well, you know, it's not question? as simple as that. Uh, no, I wouldn't agree with that, but I feel that way a lot. But it's not simple. Here's the truth. People will think a lot about more concrete subjects. Right. So there's a lot of thought going on in business, a lot of thought going on in computer programming, a lot of thought going on even in the arts. But when you ask them to do more abstract thinking, and it, not even philosophy, theoretical physics, right? you know, how many people give any thought, that, not that they should or have to, but if they tried, they would lose interest, they would not be able to do it, they're not versed. When you get up to philosophy, which is more abstract than physics, yeah. the number of people who will venture into that realm and do independent hard thinking is minuscule. So they conform. They take, it would be one thing if they said, I don't know about philosophy and I don't have any philosophical views, but it's impossible. You have to have a philosophical view. Are you here talking about ideas or are you kneeling in some mosque praying to Allah? Exactly. You can't escape it. Everyone has a philosophy. Mm -hmm. So they, the ones who don't judge for themselves go along with what they're taught, don't even realize they're going along. So that was one of her big themes, that everyone has an implicit philosophy that guides their lives. Their only, the only issue they must face is have they checked it? Have they thought about it? Right. They don't have to be original philosophers, but they should be able to judge the ideas they are hearing and see if they make sense.
No, Harry, the world in those decades were, were, was uh, going through one of the most horrible experiences in misery and genocide and war. It was the Second World War, the famine in Russia, then Mao Zedong in China, 60 million people losing their lives and in starvation because of the Great Leap Forward and the Cultural Revolution, fascism, Nazism, communism, taking away uh, all the possibilities of a light of freedom, right? Wasn't she at least happy that with her effort and Austrian economics and this movement of freedom fighters, there was at least hope that this will all end Absolutely. by the 50s and the 60s? Absolutely. And she was confident that it would end, but she didn't know if it would end in her lifetime. No, she was very optimistic about the long term. She said, no one can predict how soon or how short, but you know, once these truths are out there, the smarter minds are going to pick them up and then the followers will follow that. You don't have to go out and convert every person on the street to capitalism. You convert the opinion leaders, you know, the university professors, the editorial writers, the reporters, the commentators, the people whose job it is to deal in ideas. When they start getting this, then the man in the street will follow that. Because right. they're just following what, what they hear. Uh, aside from writing, which, which of course is her number one passion, what kind of rapport did she enjoy more? Like going to television, radio, speaking in small crowds, big For crowds? For her to, she actually did not like teaching. She did not like public appearances. Um, I think of her favorite medium, what would that be? I would guess television. She thought television was could be very intellectual. She has a great interview on the Mike Wallace show. I've you seen know, it. Which you see yeah. a, a crackling. He, he even asked him if she's not afraid of dying because she doesn't believe in anything. And her answer is amazing there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, but, you know, she kind of half converted Wallace, Mike Wallace. They, they remained friends throughout his life. That's awesome. Yeah. I hope we remain friends now after the interview. Well, the burden of proof is on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, so, I, I, I like you a lot, Gloria. Thank you very much. So let's move to a decade that I love a lot. It's the 1960s. Yeah. Oh, boy. A lot of, uh, of, of, of shifts in culture, civil rights movement, LSD, rock and roll. A lot is happening that is challenging the way that people have lived, you know, for yeah. most of the life. Yeah. And it surprises me. One of the things that I admire a lot about Ran is uh, the Playboy interview she gave in 1964 and the accurate answers about sex, love, mortality, black and white. I love oh. one answer that she gives there. Like if, if you know that white is everything that is correct and black is everything that is wrong, why would you have gray? Yeah. You know, why would you why do that? Why choose any part of the black? Yeah. And, and it seems to me, I, I've also been reading a little bit about Hugh Hefner and uh, he was a, an entrepreneur trying to put ideas out there that were quite controversial about uh, civil rights, uh, HIV, when it came out, Playboy magazine would do a lot of uh, informative uh, articles on how to prevent it, mm -hmm. things that sometimes the culture and the government would avoid. And it seems to me that she would have more respect for that kind of entrepreneur that, of course, are not philosophers, but that behave like Reardon, right? Like in, in, that in the real world, they, they, they fight for the things that are, you know, correct in their minds. Maybe in packages that are controversial, like a Playboy magazine. But what, what did you think about those, those changes in cultures when the 60s happened? Well, the 60s, were, uh, you have to divide the 60s into before 1964 and after 1964. Okay. Before 1964, they were a continuation of the 50s. I lived through this, so I'm speaking from I know. Knowing, That's why I'm know. picking your brain. <laughs> Uh, they were a, a period of quiet, repressed, uh, understatement, hedging, compromise, great. They were a great period. With 64, two things happened. The Berkeley Student Rebellion, which was the beginning of the new left, they actually formulated their position to SDS in 1963 in Port Huron, Michigan. 
64, they began the student rebellion and the rise of the hippies and jippies and violence. And that was one thing. The other was the defeat of Goldwater. Goldwater was the best candidate we've had in the 20th century. Ayn Rand supported him. They had some correspondence. He admired her to some extent. She admired him to some extent. He got killed in the election, right? He lost by a landslide. He carried only two states, Mississippi and Alabama. And that showed the left that they had control. So the student rebellion and the Goldwater defeat meant that from then on, it was the decade of drug, sex, rock and roll, right? Uh, rock and roll began in 1954, so it's, it's a certain kind of rock and roll that began this. Do you like rock and roll? I like the early rock and roll, okay. yeah, yeah. The early Elvis in the Sun sessions. Okay is my one of my top things but i also like rachmaninoff and scott joplin and operetta i'm i'm very mick i have a taste to cut across genres okay anyway the later we go into 60s the worse things get to the late 60s there's the columbia student rebellion echoing berkeley which i was fighting against at columbia i was a columbia graduate student i was kept out of my classroom by the takeover of Hamilton Hall in 1968. I was out on campus with a little booth, abolish SDS. SDS was the main, you know, organization. Do you students. have pictures of that? There is one picture of a group of us. There were seven objectivists who formed a little cl club at Columbia. I tried to shout Mark Rudd down with a bullhorn. He had a bullhorn. I got a bullhorn, went to Sir Bought a Bone and started saying, what you're seeing here is the initiation of physical force on a grand scale. This is wrong. And he stopped, you know. And you know what happened? What happened? The police came and made me move. You moved? Me. No. I said, wait a minute. You mean he can get up there and talk with the bullhorn to shut down the university, and I can't stand here and defend it. And the cop's answer was, unfortunately, he has the permission of the university. Oh. Now, there you have altruism. Right. Turn the other cheek. If they're attacking you, if they're criticizing you, give them a microphone. Let them assemble. <clears throat> if you want to defend the rights of the institution, no, you don't get to do that. We've got to be humble. We've got to listen to our enemies. We've got to love thine neighbor and thine enemy. Right. As the, you know, so... That's altruism, and uh, anyway, it became more and more violent. Uh, I also taught at the New School for Social Research on 12th Street in the Greenwich Village. One day I'm going to uh, teach a class on objectivism, as a matter of fact. And I learned that two blocks south of there, on 10th Street, I believe it might have been 11, a townhouse had been reduced to rubble because the weatherman faction was assembling a bomb in the basement of that townhouse and didn't know what they're doing, being irrationalists and drug soaked, and it blew up and killed two of them wow. and reduced the, the townhouse to a pile of bricks. Wow. So I saw these things. I saw the, the fire in the window of one of the buildings, a little light, that turned out to be the burning of 30 years of research notes of one of their professors that you know, wouldn't go along with the new left. Oh, nice. His name was Orest A. Ranum. He was a historian. Back then we didn't have computers. Right. We didn't have backup. Yeah. He had 30 years of notes on index cards and they burned them nice. because he was not radicalized. They went after the, the moderates. They didn't go after us. They kind of liked us that we were extreme on the right as they were extreme on the left. Right. So they it's let like us you, be. You can survive. <laughs> yeah, let us be. They didn't know that that was going to pay on the long run because the battle no, of ideas no. will eventually be won. By because us. Marx says ideas are nothing. Right. What counts is the economic conditions and the class struggle, and ideas are just a superstructure imposed on it. Now, Harry, also, what, what, to my understanding, the, to my understanding, the libertarian movement starts in the 60s also as a, a response to say, wait a minute, I mean, I am not conservative like the Republicans. 
I, 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 you know, I agree with civil rights and equality, not not privileges, but equality under the law well, for women. That's not quite correct. If yeah. I correct your history. Be, but but also it was because these people, to my understanding, right? They they were not comfortable by being Republican, but they liked free market. But they also were not comfortable with the socialists of the of the Democrats because they were not socialist in the economic side of it, right? So that's how the movement starts, like saying, okay, free markets and free minds. Why can't we have no, both? No, that's not correct. History. I have it all wrong. Okay. Not all wrong, but but it's it's. <laughs> you like, can give me an F after. Yeah, no, tell me um, how is it. First of all, the phrase free minds and free markets is Ayn Rand's from For the New Intellectual. Free mind and a free market are corollaries. She coined that. Second of all, the libertarian movement, the word libertarian used to describe people who were not Republican and who always held for total freedom in both realms, economics and social moral realm. And it goes, well, Mises would have been one. And there was something called the Foundation for Economic Education. And those people were, read, there yeah, still is, yeah, there still course. is. I was there with them in Atlanta. Okay, and, and they, pre, they, they went back to the 40s. They were founded in the 40s. Yeah. So there was always a tradition of thinkers who were more philosophical. Uh, there's a book called Liberty and the Great Libertarians, an anthology by Charles Sprouting that was written and includes Maria Montessori is in there. There was always a train of thinkers who were not conservatives and who wanted uh, laissez-faire, right. laissez-faire. Uh, the word libertarian began to be appropriated by more anarchist types and people who thought philosophy had no role in uh, human history. Really? Yeah. And that happened in the late 60s. Um, Murray Rothbard was a big influence there. And there was an article in the New York Times Sunday Magazine, 1970, showing two Columbia students with clenched fists, and they were libertarians. And it was sort of like hippies of the right, you know? And so they, they used the word libertarian and had some faint connection with the old school good people who were for let's say fair. Mm -hmm. And the, after that article, libertarian changed this meaning to be what we now take it to be and we now observe it, which who knows what it means. I mean, it's <laughs> there are bleeding heart libertarians. I don't know if you know about that movement who think altruism should go with the libertarian. Most of them are anti-morality, anti-philosophy, and say, look, as long as you're for freedom, you're one of us. Yeah. But what the hell does freedom mean? You have to have a definition of it, and it has to be defined in terms of physical force if you're to be consistent. And you have to know what is a valid definition and what is not. And you have to realize that under the Christian morality of altruism, the poor are the rightful owners of your wealth. Right. So it's not forced to take money from the rich to give to the poor if the poor really own that money. Mm -hmm. So th like they don't grasp any of that. Well, Harry, you know, I come from a, a libertarian university that, that is quite unique. It was founded by an engineer in the 70s who started reading Leona Reed and then went to Austrian economics and then to Rand. So when you go to my university, you have the Atlas Shrub Monument, the Bastiat Hallway, the Hayek Auditorium, the Milton Friedman uh, uh, session. And, and, and Manuel Gallao, uh, what he saw is, if we all work together, there are all kinds of, of um, we can all benefit from each other without contradicting each other. For example, the school of public choice, okay, they, that, take care, that takes care of like public policy. The way I see it, and this is the idea that I've been selling, I don't know what you think, is that objectivism is the roots of the tree, mm -hmm. the foundation, mm -hmm. the philosophical explanation of why these things matter. Without that philosophical explanation, all you have is economic theories. But if you don't have a good foundation, then you, you, you cannot sustain this against dictatorships. You know, you have to, to, to make people uh, 
switch their minds. And I've seen this in my radio work in Guatemala and all over Latin America. Mm -hmm. What young people lack, and this is why they vote for socialist dictators, is self-esteem. They are thought, since they're little, by Catholicism, by their families, not to question things, to shut up and just obey. So when you have individuals that don't have self-esteem, they grow up to be victims. Yeah. Victims don't believe that they can be responsible for their own lives because they're afraid of that. And if someone is afraid of being free, they're not going to demand freedom. So I do understand, it, although I consider myself more of a libertarian because I, I mean, I read Atlas Shrug, I read The Fountainhead, mm -hmm. The Virtue of Selfishness, Capitalism, The Unknown Idea. Like I, I understand now that one of the reasons why I can communicate the way I do is because of brand's influence. But if we work together, if libertarians and objectivists try to do the battle of ideas against the collectivism of the, the right of the conservatives and the collectivism of the left, don't you think we have a better chance of winning this battle? No. Okay. You want to know why? Why? <laughs> because you can't have effects while denying the cause. You are right, your analysis is right of what is needed. You need a philosophical base, the philosophical base of all those movements is either zero, but defiantly zero. It's zero and we're gonna keep it zero, or it's on the wrong philosophical base like public choice theory. Public choice theory is a disaster, it's collectivism. It says that the, uh, there's no difference between political power. This is the big battle we have to fight. Political power is one thing, it's a gun. Economic power is the power to offer a positive in a win-win exchange. You benefit, I benefit, we both get what enhances our lives by our own judgment freely. Politics is the realm of, this is the law, do as I say, or you go to jail. Now, good politics, which we used to have oh, about 200 years ago, says, do as I say, and what I say is leave everybody else free. Exactly. And if you violate their rights by murder, theft, fraud, we're going to put you in jail. But the honest, innocent person, we're not going to touch. So there is a role for the gun to combat the other guy's gun, but not to aim at the innocent. So uh, public choice theory, just to take one that bugs me particularly, says, no, the, the laws that govern the free market can be applied to political jockeying. So just as it's in the self-interest of Steve Jobs to make the iPhone, mm -hmm. so it's in the self-interest of Hillary Clinton to tell lies to get, you know, she will do that if it gets her head. That's not self-interest. Becoming a bigger crook is not a self is not your self interest. It's self destructive. Yeah. So we have to fight to preserve anything that clouds the issue between the dollar and the gun. Is playing into the hands. It's not even just playing in the hands. It's handing over the handcuffs to the left. Say here, chain me up. Anything that sells self sacrifice above selfishness is saying you don't have to change uh, chain me up. I'll jump into the sacrificial furnace for you. So the, the two things that we have to make clear above all is that force is one thing and business and production and money is the opposite. And that you have a right to your own life and the good is to live it and enjoy it. And both those things are destroyed by most of the movements you're saying, why don't we collaborate with? Okay. But I see one uh, connection in, in between offer, the loss of offer and demand. Okay. In the marketplace, you have supply and demand of yeah. goods and services. In the political sphere, you have the supply and demand of votes. What politicians are after is votes. And they behave like advertisement agencies. Uh, selling to you the product. No, they of, do not. They do absolutely do not. Where his right? You're making a mistake. Advertising agencies have market discipline to tell the truth. Politicians have market discipline to lie. Well, but, but, but come on, there are ads that tell you that if you wear this perfume, you're going to get girls. That's 
I mean, you can uh, attribute Boys blockers. don't wear perfumes. You mean if you wear this perfume, lotions. you get men. I mean, okay. lotions. Yeah. Or sometimes, like, when they, 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 they advertise No, the shoe. you've been brainwashed. You've been brainwashed. I've been brainwashed. You've been brainwashed. <laughs> Advertisers spread knowledge. They are educators. Now, there are dishonest, unscrupulous ones. But the force of the market is to keep them honest. It right. doesn't, it's not 100%. I it's agree. It's not 100%. But that's the tendency of the free market is that advertisers who make claims that can't be backed up are going to lose customers. Okay. Let but politicians who make claims that can't be backed up are going to gain. Okay. Well, I mean, look at Clinton and Trump. Okay, but let me give you an example I gave all over Latin America. Okay. And I say, guys, why do you think that every candidate always mentions God in Latin America. It doesn't matter if he's from the right, from the left, from the up or the down. He's like, God bless you, God will help us. They always mention God. Why do they do this? Because 95% of Latin Americans consider themselves believers. Mm -hmm. Now, if tomorrow Latin America wakes up with the news that 95% are atheists or agnostics, I bet you that no politician mentions God again. Oh, That's supply and demand. That's not supply and demand. Yes. No. Supply and demand is that you mention the truth, whatever it is, because you realize you cannot make money in the long run by duping. You can make, you can hold political power by duping the populace because you can choke off the opposition. What did, what did uh, Chavez do? What did Maduro do? They censor. Yes. Right? They interfere with the free market. Well, well, People first, would love to leave Cuba, well, well, but they first, can't. First, first they, they were democratically elected yes, right. based upon what people wanted to listen. That right. it was, we'll take from the rich and give to the right. poor. We'll right. satisfy your demand of irrationality. Mm -hmm. Once he established a dictatorship, he starts censoring uh, right. elections. Right. Okay. Right. But, that's but advertisers can't do that. They can't say, well, we lure you in with a great sounding ad. Once you buy the product, we forbid you to buy another product. You can't true. do that. Oh, no, that's true. Okay. And that's the kind of equivocation. No, we can't. You know, <laughs> Ayn Rand began by cooperating with all these people. Right. She began by trying to work with the left, and she got wised up progressively by seeing how they sold her out because mm -hmm. they would all, the deepest from what you're talking about, the philosophical base. Yeah. The base is the cause that controls the derivatives. Right. The trunk of the tree controls the branches. Yes. So if you have a bad trunk, you can't work with that because it will turn into your enemy. Like uh, the Murray Rothbard that I mentioned, a name probably familiar to many in your audience, big anarchist, uh, big, big saint of the libertarian movement. And sort of. Murray Rothbard started attending the socialist Scholars Conference of America and spoke in favor of Marxist interpretation of history, called the American flag a bloody rag, and went over to the, and started praising the communist Chinese. At the time, Mao was killing, uh, killing the people that you mentioned. The, the tens of millions. But, but, but Harry, it seems to me that we, we have a difficult with you guys as libertarians because uh, I'm not a narco capitalist. I don't believe that anarchy can work. But there is the branch of anarcho capitalism. And then if, 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 if libertarians have some theory of government, we are socialists to your eyes. So what, what can libertarians do to, you know, uh, make objectivism uh, respect? Respect us more. What are some books? Disavow, or disavow anarchism as a start. Okay. Okay. Uh, I've spoken to some leading, uh, not libertarian theorists, but libertarian, uh, what's the word I want? Businessmen, uh, heads of the movement as a movement. Uh -huh. And uh, the, those people really are not anarchists, or right. at least the ones that I'm talking to. But they can't deny it, they can't attack it because so much of their intellectual leadership is anarchist and they don't want to lose them. But anarchy, I've written several articles against anarchy. One of them's in the new release Foundations of a Free Society right. uh, compilation. Uh, anarchy is crazy and it's an attack on reason and objectivity in favor of, hey, we got to do our own thing. If I want to shoot you and claim it's self-defense, I've got a right to do that. 
That's what it comes down to. It's subjectivist. So you respect more libertarians that are for limited government? Yes, I okay. respect them more, but they have to realize that um, values have a place of course. in economics. That value, you cannot talk about free trade without property. You cannot tr talk about property without property rights. Property rights are an issue of who is right to own and control this object. Okay. So let's talk about uh, applied politics. One, oh, I want to say one more thing about the collaboration because this is a big issue. Okay. <laughs> it's not like they, these other schools haven't had a chance to read out the shrugged or capitalism, they all know an ideal. They know about it. Yeah, these course. people are not ignorant and they reject it. So there's something wrong there. Not all of us. Not all of them, no. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> when you become president, of Cato. Yaron and, will be I'm president of Cato, no, but Yaron already offered me that if I become president of Guatemala, he will be my advisor. And I'll take his word. Yeah. You become president of Guatemala and I'll move to Guatemala. Of course. You're more than welcome. But you have to give lectures in Francisco Marroquin in my, in my university. I hear very good things about Francisco Marroquin. You've never been? I've never been there, but people I know, like your own, have yes. been there and yes. have come back and with glowing reports. Yeah, he had so, a great time. Uh, and, and I'm in touch with the people translating I ran into Spanish. Oh, yeah. And uh, this is the Spanish translation. Yeah, La Rebellion yeah. de Atlas. Yeah. Because, yeah. Well, shrugged, there's no Spanish for shrugged? In one word, no. It's uh -huh. like mo levantar los hombros or uh -huh. rendirse, like surrender, I would say. Uh -huh. Rendirse. Yeah. So, Political in pra uh, practicing politics. One woman that I admire a lot because I think it's the only one that, even though in the realm of politics there's always compromise, right? But but the one I respect the most is Margaret Thatcher. I think that she was the most honest. Uh, she banned unions. She decriminalized homosexuality when it was a still a, a considered a crime in, in England. Mm -hmm. She voted for the, 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 the uh, legalizing abortion as well. Uh, and, and she was a conservative, but, but she, in her own words, she says, it was not only the socialists, those were my natural enemies. My true traitors were my, my, my conservative peers. And I, I wrote a book called, well, I've, I've written uh, three books, but I wrote a book uh, called How to Talk to a Socialist, but now I wrote a book called How to Talk to a Conservative. And I inspired a lot in Margaret Thatcher's views of conservatism as always compromising with the left, and also Anne Rand's conservatism and obituary. And obituary, yeah. yes. And, and I find that uh, I respect both of these women, and I was wondering if Anne Rand had any thoughts on Margaret Thatcher. The closest, I never heard a word about Margaret Thatcher from her, but the closest was she wrote an article um, called The Moral Factor at the time that Margaret Thatcher was coming into power and there were other European pro-liberty movements. And she was pleased. She was pleased about it. There was, I, I don't know if you know the name, Sir Keith Joseph. Sir Keith Joseph. He was yeah. the head of the economic swing of Thatcher's yeah. campaign, Institute for uh, Economic Analysis, is, is, was or is his field. Uh, and he was good. He was very influenced by her. Uh, I admire her. I mean, her style. You've got to admire uh, the ladies. Not, not for turning. Not for turning. And you know, also, when the Soviets call her the Iron Lady, she took it as a compliment. A compliment. It's like when Misa said, the only man in America, you know, like, like that yes. kind of attitude. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very clear, very forceful. And interestingly, a woman of the people, she's the daughter of a baker or something a butcher, yeah. grocer yeah and uh, rose up by her own unaided effort to make herself into an educated forceful woman i mean i admire her i think she did a terrific job i was in england at the start of the thatcher revolution mm -hmm. and the place was a dump yeah. it was a dump and it came back uh, six years later, and it was transformed. London. I, I didn't. 
you know, canvassed the whole thing. But I was in London both times for uh, not just an afternoon. I spent some time there. And the place was transformed and modernized and made benevolent and happy by the Thatcher years. So I think she was imperfect. I've heard criticism of her from uh, your uh, London uh, uh, English uh, objectivists. Right. But she has to be a hell of a lot better than anything that came before. I admire her. I have two last questions for you. Um, no one identified value as what hurts life and what improves life. Well, this value is what hurts. Yes, the and value, value is, is what, what, what improves. What like sustains. like Rand, just yeah. Rand did this. Yes. But was she only referring to human life? There's no. A, no. Life in general. Well, I mean, it's the life of a, any particular organism. So a dog, what's good for a dog is what sustains its life. What's good for me is what sustains my life. What's good for you is what, what's good for a tree is what sustains that tree's life. That's the standard of value, the only standard you can have. Other than that, aside from living organisms, there's just cause and effect. You know, there's no good and bad. When you say good and bad, it means it reflects back on the attempt of an organism to stay alive. That's what gives the value. Well, and, and, and with this one, unless you have uh, someone else that you want to add, uh, I want to ask one final question. I think this is almost impossible because everything has been written, has been said, it's in documentaries, <laughs> it's, it's, it's out there, right? Yeah. But is there anything, Harry, that you would like to share about Anne's, Anne Rand's personality? Maybe an anecdote where you both, <laughs> I don't know, were, were you know, having a conversation and laughing or something about her character that would be useful for young people in this day and age where I see that there is a lot of, because there's no study of philosophy, uh, teenagers, centennials and millennials are struggling with the fact that they are coming up as one thing in their cybernetic image, but they are not investing in human interaction and the importance of friendships and, and, and spending time with real people. With, with real human beings and not only in the computer. Is there some anecdote or something that you want to share about Rand enjoying the company of others or uh, a special topic that she liked to talk about? Um, yeah, I could tell you lots of them, but let me start with what she was like as a person. You've never met or interacted with anyone like that, I would bet. I never had. She was unlike anything else. She was a force, you know, when even though she was cordial, she was reserved, she was European, she was more, she grew up under Victorian times, you know, uh, but she was those eyes, you know, penetrated and as she was in focus. A friend of mine said that this captures her. Every minute of her life was of supreme importance to her. So she was in full focus and passionate about everything all the time. Um, and uh, I, she, she, the way she loved her husband was uh, tender and, and wonderful to watch. She would be on the couch and she would pat the couch. She'd come here, Cubby. She called him Cubby Hole. And he would come and sit next to her and she would hold his hand. And I remember after he had died, she said, you know, I won't last long without, and she only lived a couple of years after him. Uh, she t I, had a, I had a publication called uh, The Objectivist Forum published with her help. I mean, her uh, approval and she gave me her mailing list. So uh, at one point she said, I'll write you. And we were talking about her husband who had died. And she said, I'll write an article, My Debt to Frank O'Connor. And a few months later, I said, uh, what about that article you were going to write, My Debt to Frank O'Connor? You promised that you would write that. And she said, and if you really want to torture me, you'll hold me to that promise. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, she, she was devastated by the lawsuit. Of course, I didn't hold her to the promise. But uh, she loved cats, 
you know, I brought my cat over who was an alley cat. Cool. And I named him Pinky because he had a pink, really pink nose, and very pink inside of his mouth. Yeah. And uh, she petted him and she said, the Baron, Baron Von Pinky. <laughs> she called him. <laughs> she was delighted when he came over. We would play Scrabble. She put all that energy into the Scrabble game. She loved her values. She she existed for her values and above all man worship. You know, she was a hero worshiper and she looked for the heroic in everyone that she interacted with. And uh desperately wanted to see that. That's kind of the tragedy of her life is that she was born too late to see some of the giants of the 19th century, who I think were more in her style of man, right. you know. But uh, Frank was born in the 19th century and uh, she just doted on him. So it was, she was enormously powerful as a person, uh, but lighthearted. Mm -hmm. Lighthearted, fun loving, but deadly serious at the same time. It's a fascinating combination. Yeah. The, um, some people described her as frightening. Other people said she's the warmest person I've ever met. Mm -hmm. You know, a, amazing personality. I, I can relate to that. I think that a lot of empowered women have uh, a special people where they need to like put the guard down and, and, and take the sweetness, you know? Exactly, exactly. And her husband, I was going to say, I left this out. After her husband died, I was looking at some photographs of him. And what she said is, now, isn't that a benevolent face? It was very important for her to look at the good and the happy and the benevolent she didn't want to fight evil or to be, you know, this, this, uh, what's the word, a Amazon woman. She hated that kind of thing. She didn't want to have to be the staunch fighter. Yeah. Uh, she wanted to be the feminine admirer and lover. And he, uh, her, his, his happiness, his strength, his strong, kind happiness was the thing that she valued above all else, I think. Well, Harry, thank you very much for sitting down with me and letting me uh, pick your brain in so many subjects. I have had an amazing time. I hope you had it too. And uh, I did. It was fun. Yeah? It was exciting. I'm glad. <laughs> And to all of you, thank you for tuning in. Share this interview with your friends. It's going to be in the ARI uh, webpage and all the platforms. And uh, keep on uh, watching because we have other interviews with other scholars about the philosophy of objectivism.